Thank you very much. Next presenter is from uh, West Virginia State University, Mr. T.J. Park. Well, hello everyone. Well, my topic well today, well in this presentation is about the PSBFK. Well, that is what the Public Foundation in Korea, which was founded in 1965. And actually, a lot of people don't know what Public did uh, in South Korea. And actually, well, this organization played a major role in promoting what is called multiculturalism, at least one well, in South Korea. So I will give a, a brief, you know, uh, you know, history. I mean, explanation about what, how it began uh, with Pearl Buck, and then how it, it became an important institution in South Korea. So let me give you some background, you know, information here. So Pearl Buck, as you may know, well, uh, she was the first person I mean who coined the term Amerasians. Amerasians mean what? American Asians, uh, not Asian Americans. They were born in Asia. They were basically Asians, but they were fathered or mothered by American citizens. So, uh, well, but as you may know, well, in Asia, well, uh, you know, the nations are pretty homogeneous. So these people were highly, you know, discriminated and prejudiced. And so, you know, purple. Uh, was the first person I mean who actually created a welfare agencies for for uh, uh, especially with children uh, Amerasian children so the welcome houses are for adoption uh, bringing these uh, you know uh, especially often that you know uh, you know Amerasians I mean into American families so you know they can have a, a kind of a better life in America the other way is uh, to found the world a foundation they would help I mean the majorities of Amerasians left well in Asia basically I mean, to help them and successfully get integrated into the society of uh, you know in which they grew up so uh, the first branch overseas branch of a public foundation was created well in 1965 in Seoul I'm no 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 I'm sorry in Bucheon the city of Bucheon in South Korea so here in her book, in 1966, well, her basically explained what, you know, what motivated her, I mean, to become a uh, really determined person, I mean, to establish, I mean, the foundation here. I mean, it reads like, I mean, three and a half years ago, to be exact, business took to me, uh, took me to Japan to live for many months uh, somewhere in those months I accepted an invitation to Korea. I was generously treated as always but on the sidelines of a hospital busy life of a favored guest. I saw fringe of a sad face on lonely children always standing apart. They begged on city streets. They wandered the country road, racked and lost in search of a food. I came back to my country and my heart uh, full of sorrow and determination. So at least, well, according to this, well, uh, probably uh, so the plight of, you know, these mixed race children, how they were uh, mistreated well, in South Korea. And this actually happened, well, in 1960. Uh, that's, well, the first time I probably visited, you know, South Korea. And she was invited by a businessman named uh, Yul Han. Uh, who later helped them and probably went to found or actually was the foundation there in South Korea. And what is also important to know is this one. Uh, what is uh, what what Perbug actually wanted I mean to achieve I mean, with the foundation. And this is uh, also in the same book, I mean she wrote this. And basically she said, you know, we do not plan to set up institutions or orphanages. There are already enough of those in Korea and in them there are, there are many of the American, uh, American Korean children who are usually segregated. And the total purpose of whatever we do will be to integrate the American Korean child into Korean society by helping them 
to become a good citizen in that land of his birth, and therefore a benefit to his fellow citizens and not a burden or uh, a curse. So basically what this foundation was to help, I mean, uh, these Amerasian children, mixed race children, into the societies where they were born. So this is basically different. Uh, from you know the adoption agents or whatever, and the Purba was the first person who did this. So basically, uh, Purba had well three uh, you know concepts here, uh, because well these children, uh, they, a lot of them were just basically abandoned because well the marriage was not really legal, and they just stayed there well, in Asia for a while, and then I mean they came back American soldiers mostly. So these are uh, well children. Anyway, they are born out of uh, American citizens, so therefore, Americans should take uh, some responsibility I mean, for the plight of uh, these children. Uh, that's one basic concern. And also adoption. There were some adoption agencies in those days, well, especially, especially I mean, they were backed by you know, the church uh, organizations and so on. But only 10% of them were adopted. Uh, by the 50s, by the 1950s, 60s. So the vast majority of the, these uh, Amerasian children were uh, left alone. So basically that's what she wanted I mean, to do, to help I mean, these uh, you know, uh, vast majority of the Amerasian children, mixed race children, I mean, to be successful I mean, in the countries of, uh, of their birth. So here, uh, how many then were uh, uh, these uh, Amerasian children? I mean, in Korea, I mean, in the in the in the 1960s, uh, there were uh, really a lot of uh, you know American GIs. I mean, after the Korean War in the 1950s, in the 60s also. So uh, we don't have you know I can't find actually well the exact you know number of us, uh, these Amerasian children, but roughly about you know fifty thousand, according I mean to a book you know suggested well uh, well uh, public's book actually well and well they asked well the, the Korean government and the Korean government sent a letter and in. In that letter, well, it was suggested about 50,000 or so. But this was a, a relatively small number compared, I mean, to the number of uh, Amerasian children in Japan and, uh, and the Philippines and so on. But, you know, uh, the racial, I mean, kind of uh, prejudices against well, these children was most severe here in S South Korea. So anyway, Perlberg remembered, I mean, she attended, well, the opening ceremony of the uh, PSBFK Souza Opportunity Center in Buchan. That's the city's name, Buchan, just nearby, you know, uh, the capital city. And the Souza here is uh, just, I mean, the name of a district. So uh, it was in June 1967, and, well, uh, the facilities were all set up, and, well, hundreds of uh, mixed children attended. And she remembers, I mean, this is the most important day for her life. And uh, well, basically, uh, this is a picture that I took I mean, uh, from the Pearl Memorial Hall in South Korea. And you can see here, well, uh, certainly, well, the Pearl Bog is here uh, with the Amerasian children here. And also, this was the main building. Uh, what it says of Pearl Jadan, meaning what the Pearl Foundation. And this is uh, the whole compound. And actually, the land and the facilities on the buildings were actually donated by the businessman named well, you, Mr. Here. So, and then, well, today, I mean, these buildings are all gone. But instead, well, the city of Buchan actually, well, built a very nice, you know, memorial hall for Paul Ball. So I, I, I went there, I mean, in July. I took a pictures like this. So this is a uh, kind of uh, the outer entrance, and you see, I mean, the other buildings, the old buildings, are all uh, demolished. But in 2006, well, they built what well, this memorial uh, building. Uh, this is the, uh, the memorial hall. So what it says is, uh, well, Paul Buck Foundation. Uh, no, 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 memorial hall. I'm sorry. Yeah, in Korean. And this is the entrance, pretty modern. And once you got in, then I mean, you see the miniature of the Opportunity Center, which was uh, actually opened uh, in 1967. 
And actually, Paul Berg, I mean, lived there, I mean, for a couple of years, actually, until 1968. So, uh, about, you know, what, 200, almost 200, you know, uh, you know, Amerasian children, they were accommodated, actually. Uh, so, and a lot of, you know, children, I mean, could come. And practically speaking, I mean, these people, these, you know, children, I mean, they felt at home only in this area or in military camp towns. Elsewhere, I mean, they, they would just stay with that because, I mean, just, just look, I mean, different. And today, I mean, well, uh, there are some exhibition of uh, some of the materials, I mean, typewriting, typewriter, and, you know, books and so on. And pretty, uh, and also you see, I mean, well, you know, the, uh, the wax figures, <laughs> a pearl bug, and there were children here. So, pearl bug uh, is a still. Uh, over there, and outside of the building, also you see the bust here, Perbox bust, and also what this is uh, another picture, and there is a kind of a very nice park just outside of it. So you know, in 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 the in the sixties when this was uh, this opportunity center was opened up. Then it was surrounded by, you know, by just, you know, what the, the countryside, I mean, you know, farmlands. But now it's a very busy, I mean, uh, you know, what, uh, uh, you know, crowded, you know, uh, residential area. But anyway, here, how then, you know, Amerigian children were treated? The Korea is known as a, as a Confucian country. So basically what? If you're not, if your fathers are not Korean, then you are not, you know, Korean. Basically, that's the rule. So, I mean, these children are born out of uh, American fathers, mostly. So, therefore, what? They were treated as a foreign people. And also, a lot of the mothers were all engaged in what? You know, what sexual uh, service jobs. So, therefore, what? Their fatherless children are prostitutes. The government didn't care. So, they were treated as uh, orphans. And the, the you know the, the kind of uh, the encouragement I mean uh, by the government people is basically okay you go to America well that's your father's country and what well, that's the best I mean for you. So are there policies I mean at the government level? Well, there are kind of a policies, but not really official. Uh, but you know basically what the government promoted was. Well, for an adoption, adoption. I mean, uh, they might be sent out, you know, what to foreign countries as adoptees. Well, if they are under the age of 13, and well, they will, or they would be uh, exempted from Korean military service, which is, which was obligatory, and well, you know, to offer job training and so on through, you know, the public foundation. Uh, but that's not significant. And but they, they, they. Are, had never been any, you know, integration policy or whatever at that time. And well, uh, you know, I can't really find, you know, official data how many of them were actually registered and got some kind of a help I mean, from the Purple Foundation or from the government. But roughly about uh, 30 years or so until the middle of the 1990s, about, you know, 4,005 hundred, you know, Amerasians uh, got registered. Meaning what? Uh, you know, if we measure, well, at least, well, if there had been, you know, more than 30,000 or so, uh, actually, uh, most of them uh, were not even getting, you know, any benefit. But uh, actually, well, the Purple Foundation was the only, uh, only, uh, you know, agency at that time that is helping Amerasian uh, children. Okay, uh, so uh, basically what? Uh, the prejudices were so strong, so uh, the best way is uh, to come to the United States. And one way is uh, uh, being adopted into American families. But, you know, the, it, it's a pretty competitive. So only about, you know, what, 10% of them could uh, be, uh, you know, sent them into America you know, as adoptees. And you see in the 70s, 80s, what? Well, uh, you know, the Korean government was so eager I mean, to send out, I mean, you know, all these you know, children. So almost 60% of all foreign-born children adopted by U.S. families were Korean, ethnic Korean. Uh, how many of them were Amerasians? We don't know. And here, this is a godsend opportunity to Amerasians. In 1982, the Congress passed I mean, the Amerasian Act. 
And well, this was basically prompted by the uh, you know Vietnamese refugees and so on. So, but anyway, uh, you know, Vietnam, Korea, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia. Okay, uh, if these children's uh, fathers are definitely American, then what? Well, they could come to the United States as immigrants. So, you know what? Uh, John Shade, I mean, the director, executive director of PSP Foundation in America, and the Reverend, you know, Alfred Keen. I mean, they were brought. Uh, to provide, you know, uh, valid testimonies about how, you know, uh, these Americans and children were mistreated. So there were two uh, different opinions. Kian said basically, oh, in Asia, you know, you cannot eliminate them with these, you know, what uh, prejudices. So it's impossible to integrate these children because they don't accept. I mean, these Asians don't accept them as regular members of society. But John Shea, I mean, present, okay, well, at least, well, in the end, I mean, well, these children should be accepted as regular members of society. Uh, although he actually supports, I mean, the passage of the law. So in the end, well, you know, Kian, I mean, presented a lot of, you know, what, uh, letters written by, you know, Amerasians from Korea. Uh, they got, you know, scholarships, I mean, from the public foundation. So they were attending American colleges and they wrote letters, and basically they said, well, they just desperately want them I mean, to stay in the United States. So eventually what the law was passed. So you see, I mean, in the 1980s, 90s, most of the Amerasian children actually came to the United States uh, through Immigration Act. Now, uh, Korean attitude is so, um, definitely against well mixed races. So that's just uh, even after you know the 1990s. Well, uh, Janet Janet Minchu is a uh, uh, in the other room. I mean uh, she also talks about this. And well, okay now um, <clears throat> what is okay. Uh, now, in the 1990s, however, something happened, you know, uh, so uh, Amerasian children are diminished in number, but, you know, more and more Korean men, they adopted what, you know, foreign brides, I mean, from less developed Asian countries. So, mixed children between Korean and, well, other Asians are called, what, Koshians, or so-called Koshians. They became, well, <laughs> I'm sorry, they became the majorities of mixed children in South Korea, and, uh, now you see, I mean, some of the different attitudes, I mean, from the Koreans. Now, because, well, the Koreans are the fathers. In this case, what? Well, these children are legitimate. Unlike, your well, you know, Amerasian children. And also, uh, their mothers are not prostitutes, so, you know, they're better treated. Eh? Yes. Uh, but, primarily, what well, the Koreans began to feel about, you know, the, uh, the problems, demographic problems problems, you know. Uh, in the countryside, men are increasingly difficult, well, you know, to find out marriage partners, uh, or, you know, young ladies left, I mean, for big cities and so on. So the government needed to do something to, build, to bring, I mean, you know, foreign brides, I mean. So you see, I mean, the Korea is well demographic trend like this. So you see, uh, from the 1990s, you clearly see, I mean, what? Uh, you know, you know, couples have less and less children. <laughs> so, you know, Asia is what? It's based on labor intensive industries. So, without, you know, labor forces, I mean, they, their economies cannot grow. So, the government is really concerned. So, by the middle of the 21st century, I mean, well, you know, uh, Korea will become an extremely aged society like this. So the symptoms began to appear in the 1990s. So the government began, I mean, you see, I mean, here, the, the labor force, I mean, Korea, I mean, 30% down, I mean, is even worse than Europe. It's a, the, the projection is like that. So, you know, eventually the Korean government decided, I mean, to embrace, you know, what is called multiculturalism, which means accepting well foreign people and their children, mixed children as a regular members of a society. So this happened I mean, from 1998, slowly, 
And then you see uh, the government created the so-called centers for multicultural families and so on. And the PSBFK had been the only private I mean, agency and it remains still as the only private agency that helps I mean, multicultural families. And you see uh, there is a big, you know, uh, propaganda stunt in what campaign I mean, for Korea. The Korean government actually found, okay, well, this uh, Amerasian, uh, Hans Ward, I mean, his mother, I mean, they were uh, public, publicly invited, I mean, so, I mean, they were kind of, uh, you know, portrayed in the media as a hero. Oh, this guy is a hero, I mean. Uh, I mean, 99% of the Koreans don't know even the rules of uh, the football game, uh, the American <laughs> football game. It doesn't matter. Uh, his, uh, you know, his mother is a Korean, uh, self, you know, sacrificing, you know, mother and so on. This was a to pave a kind of a way of for legislation. I mean, to you know, create, uh, you know, the law to support multicultural families. So this became the basis of a Korean multicultural policies today. So it was in 2008. So anyway, uh, to make it short, basically, uh, let me just bring, uh, you know, to the conclusion here. So basically what? Uh, although it's not really well known, PSB is a, in fact was well, the pioneer of uh, multiculturalism in South Korea. And this fact is not well known. And also, uh, well, the primary beneficiaries, of course, are Koshians, not Amerasians. But eventually, uh, you know, 50 or two generations after it was founded, the Korean government actually accepted the principle of uh, multiculturalism. So, I mean, this fact is uh, important to remember. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>